Hi, my name is Tracy Dix Williams, and as the former curator of social history, I have been involved in developing and bringing in interpretation here at Ironbridge for well over 25 years. Now, this presentation is looking at the practical considerations of first and third person interpretation, formats that are all part of living history or museum theatre. And it's really important to note. Just like history itself, these formats don't all sit in neat little spheres. There can be wide-ranging uses of it, and it is styles that have been developed. And you need to be very sure of how you are going to present your history and in what format you're going to use to best present this. Ironbridge has a long history of using both first and third person interpretation as part of its daily offer at its Bliss Hill Victorian town. Bliss Hill shows what life was like in a coal mining town at the turn of the 19th century. It does this by inhabiting the original buildings which have been rebuilt on site with typical objects and artefacts of the time and costume staff and volunteers who welcome the visitors and explain about the works and lifestyles which would have gone on in these buildings. The development of living history has been sporadic, especially in the UK, and only in recent years there has been a focused attempt to codify it and to bring sense to what many individual practitioners were undertaking and developing to suit their own requirements. Professor Stacey Roth, in her book, Past into Present, pulled together a very useful glossary of the more evident styles, and more recently, IMTAL have published a very succinct view of what is interpretation on their website. There are also some great publications and articles available which have moved the focus away from the debate of the appropriateness of the format to concentrate more on the use and positive outcomes, such as the extensive study, performance, learning and heritage undertaken by the Centre for Applied Theatre Research at the University of Manchester. This investigated and evaluated a range of case studies over three years. Living history as a tool to aid museum interpretation has grown in use in the UK since the early 90s, but it's fair to say it has not been a peaceful growth. It does have quite a contentious past and many negative views have been expressed regarding it, from concerns of Disneyfication to Blackadder history to outright discuss that any sort of theatrics and spectacle should have a place within a museum learning environment. It is a format which has been easy to criticise and harder to applaud. The initial scepticism and sporadic approach has made people wary and defensive when coming out in support of it. Plus, even today, it is a movement which is still in its early years, and so its impact and benefits are still under-researched, much less published or shared widely. Here at Ironbridge, we are not saying we are the best at living history, or that we've always got it right. As you will hear later, we have made a number of mistakes, but we do have a long history in using it. We have a clear understanding of how it sits in our museum-wide interpretation strategy, and we continually review it and its contents to ensure it aligns with and fully supports the ethos of the site. Open Air Museums have particularly embraced living history and there are many examples of it being used to educate and engage people from as early as the 1850s. But the more formal approach to developing an open air museum and incorporating living history as a tool for engagement in its own right can be seen with the development of Skansen in 1891. Arthur Azelius was a Swedish teacher and folklorist who as early as 1870 was rescuing the buildings, artefacts, clothing, tools and machinery of a fast disappearing rural lifestyle in Sweden. He displayed the artefacts against painted backdrops with life-size dolls dressed in traditional costume, but he felt that these were adequate but dry shells of the past. In 1878 he saw a lifelike tableau at the Paris Exposition and was thus inspired to pull his objects back into the homes and interiors from where they had come. In 1881, a visit to the world's first open-air museum, King Oscar II's Royal Collection of Buildings, gave him the motivation to open his own open-air museum. This was Skansen, which he opened in 1891. The site had over 150 houses and buildings, 
each filled with a wonderful array of objects, clothing, everyday items, and it proved a huge success with the visitors who were encouraged to view it as their property and legacy. He added to this venture people in traditional dress, interpreters, craft folks and musicians, as well as domestic and farm animals, and the museum celebrated folklore, traditional Swedish holidays and historic events, and it soon became the template for open-air museums across the world. A visit to the site or even the website today will show you that the founders' aims still live on in the museum today. This approach was quickly adopted in America and in Canada with its national parks, commonly called living history museums. Its rise began with Henry Ford's Greenfield Village in Dearborn, Michigan in 1928, but it was Colonial Williamsburg which opened in 1934 which had the greatest influence on museum development in North America. One of the earliest examples in Great Britain was St Fagans. The museum was opened to the public in 1948 under the name of the Welsh Folk Museum and this museum included more than 40 buildings which represented the architecture of Wales. This was followed in the early 70s by Beamish, set up to preserve the region's traditional industries of coal mining, shipbuilding and iron and steel manufacture, and our own Blissill Open Air Museum, as it was then called. Blissill never set out to be what it is today. Its aim was to rescue historic buildings and monuments which were endangered by the Telford Newtown development. A small party of guides and volunteers took people around the site and spoke about the history of the buildings which had been rebuilt on a parcel of land, rich in industrial monuments and landscape. Very quickly, it was decided to clothe these staff in Victorian costume, as this was the era which was most consistent with the buildings that had been recreated. And by the mid-1980s, the site had developed to represent a Victorian town, and the guides remained in their chosen buildings, and that information was added about the trades which were demonstrated there and the objects which was displayed. This was the start of our third person demonstration. Soon after we added actors to the street, initially to support events but then to grow and become part of the daily offer. At Bliss Hill our third person interpreters are more commonly known as demonstrators. They are modern people talking about the past as the past. They are based in exhibits and address in period reproductions of costume to ensure that they do not look at odds with the setting. As with all things, there are a lot of pros and cons with this format. It's not possible to go through them all, but I thought it was worth exploring some of the more obvious. Demonstrators are the most adaptable, engaging interactives you can get. They hardly ever break down, and they can adjust their talk to suit the requirements and expectations of the audience, and they learn as well as teach. Because they can look back in past, talk about the current world and speculate about the future, they can bring a wider understanding to a topic. They can show how the development of the Victorian era has influenced the world we know today and they help the visitors to put their knowledge in context. They can inspire the visitors to explore and to make connections with the subject matter and the artefacts and to get them to ask questions and become involved in the process rather than just be an observer to it. They can be great ambassadors and advocates for the museum. A person in costume is visible. They are instantly seen as being the person to go to. And a great demonstrator, who is well trained, approachable and engaging, will set the tone for your site. They can be very persuasive. They are a great marketing tool. And as visitors to museums are now seeking experiences as well as enlightenment, they can be instrumental in delivering this. And don't knock this. Just the simple gesture of posing for a photograph of a visitor is a positive. It is something different from the ordinary and is something that the visitor seeks out and is involved in. It is a personal memory maker and it further cements the visitor's relationship with your site. It's enjoyable and any visit to a museum should be educational and enjoyable and there doesn't need to be a polarised stance between the two. As you would expect, there's some aspects of the format which are challenging too. It's not a format which suits everyone. It is public speaking in an environment where your audience can be all around you and are constantly coming in and out of the exhibit. 
So the demonstrator needs to be able to control the environment and ensure that all visitors are acknowledged and engaged. The questions the visitors ask can be as wide-ranging as the demographic of the visitors to the site. And though we don't advocate a script, we do need consistency. Our demonstrators operate across every day of the week and in a number of exhibits and we need to be consistent in what we are telling our visitors, especially where school parties are involved and especially if they have worksheets. To ensure this, we provide demonstrator information sheets at induction. These contain information about the buildings and key facts about the trade in which is being demonstrated. Staff and volunteers spend time in exhibits, being mentored by experienced staff, and as their knowledge and confidence grows, so their talk expands, under the direction of the curatorial team and our duty officer, who ensure that the day-to-day -day offer is as we require it. It can be a big investment developing third-person demonstrations and, you know, costumes are a big part of that and we will talk about that a little later, but, you know, it's a lot of money to produce a complete outfit for someone. We usually know within a couple of weeks if demonstrators are going to stay with us because it is such an unusual role. But on top of all of that, we have to do a lot of customer service training. We do training in performance skills. And in addition, a lot of our demonstrators have to make something in their exhibits. So we have to teach them all the traditional skills and crafts too. And it can take a while to teach someone to be a Victorian iron worker or a foundry man. So one of the big things you've got to think about with living history interpretation is consistency and how you maintain it. We have wonderful exhibits like this and we work really hard to make sure that the artefacts are all right, that the historic information that's being told is absolutely accurate. But sometimes it can be the little details that will let it down as well. And uh, even the best of demonstrators can sometimes get a bit forgetful and bring in modern elements without thinking, such as uh, the mugs, Tony. <laughs> The visitors really want to catch you out. They love to see a forgotten watch on a wrist or even someone wearing a plaster. And we have had a few occasions when our younger staff have come into work sporting neon pink hair because they went to a special party at the weekend. And there are certain concessions we have to make to health and safety, such as goggles worn during the foundry casting or the need for modern spoke detectors in some of our exhibits. But this should not be the floodgates for letting in other concessions and nor should they be the reason for stepping back from the format. With clever thinking you can get around many of the obstacles and with some you just have to be honest as to what you can actually deliver. Once you are in costume you are never off duty and everything about you is available for the visitor to comment on and explore as some of our demonstrators will tell you. The visitors really want to know everything and even down to what we've got in our baskets and if we're not careful they'll be in there having a look to see if we've got the Victorian butties. Some people think we live here but we don't, they make us go home. But I quite like to spend a night here and see where all the wild animals emerge from. People come in and say, oh this is a lovely job sitting by the fire all day. And of course I have to try and keep very calm and explain that that isn't our job, that sitting down was probably just five minutes of that particular hour and that our day is spent talking to visitors, cleaning the cottage and as I say sitting down is our last requirement of enjoyment of the cottage. Once I was walking past um, a gentleman visitor as the headmistress and he went Excuse me, that's not Victorian perfume, that smells like my wife's perfume, Givenchy. So I can assure you, from then on, the headmistress always took a little rose water. Hello, I'm Jill Jordan. I'm the Managing Director of Sundar Theatre. We're a group of professional actors, musicians and historic reenactors, and we've been providing first-person interpretation here at Bliss Hill for over 15 years. First person interpretation is where the interpreter portrays a person from the past as if it is the past. They may be a genuine historic character or as in the case at Bliss Hill, pastiches from the past. 
Most of our work is based on the streets of Blist Hill, um, interacting with each other as characters or interacting with the public or being part of the special events team. Uh, on occasions we do drop into the exhibits um, but obviously that has to be in keeping with the character that, that we are so perhaps the policeman might drop in and say everything in order miss. Unusually for many museums we work as part of the daily offer as it was felt by the museum that combination of first and third interpretation provided the best learning experiences for the visitors. That said as with third person interpretation there are pros and cons with the first person. Currently we have a number of set characters and pieces that we perform each day and this format has been pulled together through a review and evaluation of a number of styles and formats which we have tried over the years. Some successful, some not so. We initially began by trying to recreate the work of a local authoress who was writing very accurate portrayals of the hardships of the working class in the local area through the medium of storytelling. The performances were broken into five scenes which were played out throughout the day and there was a level of engagement where a young child would be pulled from the audience to take part in certain aspects. As a starting point it worked well. It had local historic connections, its subject matter perfectly matched the ethos of the site and it was a story which had drama, empathy, insight and a moral issue. Where it didn't work was on a more practical level. The visitors needed to see all five chapters to get the story. Some were not on site throughout the day, so to set the scene it had to be narrated, which took away the belief that the visitors were encountering a typical activity. And there was not always a child in the audience. In addition, as the visitors are all around you making up an audience, at the end of the scene it was very difficult to exit the site. Taking this on board we developed a range of playlets which were one-off scenes and which picked typical town themes as a source such as an encounter with a doctor discussing a wife's health with her errant husband. These worked well as they were not linked with other activities and so there were no loss of continuity they were able to give different and often opposing viewpoints which can really help the visitor have a better understanding of an issue and they helped develop a range of characters which the audience were able to go on and build relationships with. In terms of developing this we felt the scenes were too regimented and didn't give us the freedom to engage the audience within them and ensuring the visitors knew where the scenes were at what time and how long they would take. Today we have a mixture of these and many more aspects which we have tried. There are some elements of scripted performance but our characters are free to roam and engage with the audience flexibly. They have learned from experience what works well and what visitors are actually looking for. More importantly, how not to trap a visitor into engaging with them if they do not want to. In the early days, the British public were not as comfortable with encountering a character as they are now and we worked really hard to ensure that any performance was done in such a way that people could opt in or out to what level they were comfortable with. We are noticing though today that most of our visitors want characters and don't recognise that the third person demonstrators are not being lazy because they did not present themselves in this way and this is something that we may have to go back and review. It is another important fact. What kind of induction do you need to give to your visitors before they enter the site? So Jill, I'm often asked what makes the best first person interpreter? I know some people believe that it should be a curator because they've got the depth of history and the knowledge of the customs and the era and I'll admit, as a former curator, I could bring that to the table, but I have no performance skills. I could never get up in front of anyone and sing and be larger than life. What do you think? I think um, you have a choice as a museum. Um, you can either go for someone who is um, 
academically trained yeah. and then has some drama experience or you can have someone like the, the actors in Sundial who are um, trained in drama yeah. and then do their own research but it really is what is and what works for your site. So you do a lot of research yourself yeah. rather than just the script you're given? Yeah. I think to be able to immerse yourself in that character and remain in character sometimes for about seven hours <laughs> that you have to know your stuff. Uh, for example. When Irish eyes are smiling Short is like a man in spring The actors need to be comfortable with what and who they are portraying. Much is made of the audience's reactions to first-person interpretation when it's showing difficult and controversial material. But it can be very difficult for the actor as well. They're able to see firsthand the reactions they are eliciting. They can be in a vulnerable position and they have to manage the scene and the audience and sometimes it's not easy. Skilled reenactors or groups such as ours who specialise in historic reenactment do work at this different level of understanding and engagement. Because of this we can ensure the piece is both entertaining and educational. The bicycle stealing scene is a very popular part of the day, which due to the movement of the policeman chasing the robber and the noise it generates, it quickly attracts a crowd. For many they will simply enjoy the scene, take lots of photos of the policeman and be entertained. But this should not mask how much information is being imparted or the skill which is being used in presenting it. You hear all sorts of information about the cost of bikes, the fact that it is part of the kit the policeman is issued with to do his job, what the penalty was for stealing, and even the pride the policeman has in his role. In terms of performance, the audience are all engaged. They may not know it, but they're taking the information in, and the team have developed a very fun but memorable way of exiting the stage. And you lot move along as well. What do you think this is, for goodness sake? What the world's coming to. You've been hard in infancy. By shouting at the audience, they're all suddenly part of it. It's really interesting to note, too, how much being a part of this can be confidence building. Morris, the would be robber, is quite a timid man and part of the third person interpretation team at the museum. He's not trained in any way but he's developed this sketch with the policeman. Throw away the key, constable, not my mother! Oh yes, I'm going to tell your mother what you've done and when you get home she'll give you a sight more of what I'm going to give you the start of now. Ow! So, Jill, your, your characters today are quite free roaming, I gather. Yes. Is there ever a time when you need to script them? Yeah, there are occasions. Um, as I said, uh, special events, uh, they often have to be scripted if we're adapting a, a book. Okay. Um, or on one occasion we did an event called The Big Draw oh, no. where we were looking at uh, pre-Raphaelite art and we had a, a wonderful script all about the artists. It had to be um, accurate and pertinent to, to the, the time. Do you find that more stressful playing real characters who lived or do you prefer the free roaming? I like both. Yeah. Um, obviously with the real characters you really do have to know uh, the information. So people always think first person is like the sexier format to use. Would you agree? I do agree. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> um, whereas, you know, from my point, no disrespect to yourself, but third person just lets you have a wider context. So mm -hmm. do you think that's why the strength of Ironbridge is that it uses both? Yeah, I think they've got the best of both worlds. The musical, again, on the face of it may seem like pure entertainment but this is giving visitors unique opportunities to engage and experience and at a time when visitors are looking for enlightenment and experience from their museum visits this really works well 
It works for those involved, but it's adding another layer to the backdrop and sensory perception of those not in the pub, but who may be hearing the singing floating through the air. Another popular outcome of this is school groups. They all gather round the window, learning perhaps sons of the sea. And imagine if these children went home after their trip to Blist's Hill, bobbing and singing the sons of the sea song to their grandparents and their parents. What a wonderful learning outcome that would be. As I mentioned, there are some different formats which can be used by museums. Second person is a newer format, which involves the visitor being engaged in the interpretation rather than just being an observer to it. This can be either as themselves, as modern people, or by assuming the role as an historic character, such as the Follow the North Star program at Connor Prairie, an interactive history park in Indiana. Here, visitors pretend to be fugitive slaves as a way of learning about the Underground Railroad. This has been brought in after an extensive review of what people were learning and how engaged they were with the museum and its collections. Now evidence shows that this style of interaction and participation really does help to set the information in the visitors' minds and that for many it really does help them recall the facts, remember the sites and the artefacts and it can greatly enhance people's understanding of the heritage portrayed especially when making an emotional response to it, and this increases their desire to repeat the experience. Many educators support role-playing as a way for visitors to learn by doing, but be sure of what you want the outcome of this to be, allowing people to think critically about history and make personal connections between history and their own lives is a great tool. But allowing visitors to portray prominent historic figures and to make their own choices and to even change the outcome of historic fact can cause confusion and a flawed understanding if it's not carefully managed. So I believe our use of living history interpretation allows Bliss Hill to be a site that just interprets to all the senses. It is all around you. You hear the historic facts that are being told to you, but you also hear the noise of the machinery and the equipment that's being used. You know, it is a site where you can taste history, a particular favourite of mine here. You can touch it. We encourage you to, to really engage with the objects that are on display. And it is a site that sometimes you can particularly smell. But uh, it all works together to make a 360 degree sensory interpretation that fully engages you in its offer. For me, another great output is what I call the onion scenario. The demonstrator can pull an object in context. For example, this flat iron. Pull on display, which is static, it tells us a story. It is a piece of domestic laundry equipment circa 1850. But here in the toll house, one moment it's being used for laundry, but the next it can be used to prop open the door. I've even seen it being used to crack open nuts for cookery demonstrations. This is layers and stories all coming together to tell a much bigger picture. Now we're really lucky. We have a whole town as a performance space here at Bliss Hill. But historic performance can work well in many locations and it can be just as effective large scale and more intimately. A study by the Centre for Applied Theatre Research at the University of Manchester, Performance, Learning and Heritage investigated the uses and impact of performance as a medium of learning and interpretation by really investigating four different venues with case studies. And one of the first case studies was the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich, which has run actor-interpreter programmes for over 10 years at various locations. Using actors brought in from professional interpretation companies they feel it allows them to really drill down into some of the stories that are often forgotten. The Gunner's Tale is a 30 minute single character monologue within a defined space and performance time. There is nothing in terms of a backdrop for the performance. A sailcloth is laid on the floor to mark where the area is and the audience are invited to sit or stand around the space as they feel fit. This simplicity does not detract in any way from the audience engagement and learning. Evidence from the study clearly showed that the audience related positively to the character and that history really was brought alive and that they were able to connect to it in a personal way 
and that for some, in a way that they just had not expected, they connected with the struggles and the lifestyles of the character and they empathised. Empathy can be a powerful tool, especially when introducing characters into performance, but care must be taken. PLH also identified in their case studies an empathy paradox, where visitors can gain such a sense of empathy for a character that they lose sight of the bigger picture and the historical context. In part, this can be countered by the appropriate framing and opportunities to reflect with an out-of-role question and answer session. This is hard to control, and it is a theme echoed by Nicole Moore, a public historian and consultant who specialises in interpreting slave life in the USA. She is keen that having engaged with an encounter, the visitor does not simply walk away saying what a shame it is that that person is betraying a slave, or how awful it was that slavery happened, but that they do put themselves into the historic context of the moment and realise what it was like and do actually examine their responses to it. To go beyond thinking that if they had been there, they would have helped the slaves to escape or brought them and set them free. She wants them to really question the time and the attitudes and to consider if these actions were indeed feasible or if they would have actually made any difference. Would they, in reality, have risked their own freedom to do this? And are they considering all the implications it would have had for them and their family? This is a consciousness that she believes brings a teachable moment in interpretation. The most visible aspect of first and third person interpretation is the costume. Yet it is something which can be so easy to get wrong. And we have found over the years that visitors are getting more aware of period costume and how it should look and they are less forgiving when it is wrong. From the outset, a costume department was set up to produce our clothing to a very specific criteria. The original patterns were drafted up from period patterns and then adapted to fit the modern body. This ensured we kept lots of the details, such as the curved seams in the shoulders and arms and the correct goring on skirts, and the really fiddly and difficult to do plackets in men's shirts. We used a number of sources, such as the Taylor and Cutter books, 1890 school lesson plans for dressmaking, and we copied a lot of items from our original costume collection. The bulk of the clothing we produce is what we term working class, and it is from around 1890 to 1910 in style. We produce all the clothing for the staff on site to ensure that we do maintain the standards. This is a big investment financially and in terms of time and it is something you need to think about if you are going to explore this avenue. We try wherever possible to buy natural fabrics, typical of what would have been available at the time. But with the increasing technological advances in textiles, this is getting more and more difficult to do. We also need to be able to launder the costumes in modern washing machines and dryers, so this does have a bearing on the level of finish that we can do on some of the items. As living history has increased in popularity, there are now a number of really good outlets which you can purchase excellent quality clothing from, such as Reenactors Markets, our own costume project, and there's a whole range of uh, specialist dressmakers that can be found on the internet. Well, we're really lucky here, actually, because we've got a very good library and archive that's been built up over many, many years, and that proves to be a real treasure trove of information for us. So when it comes to the exhibits and the kind of information that we give to staff, or the, the, the first or third person uh, uh, demonstrators that we've got out in the museums, we make real use of our archival material. The old photographs, uh, old books, records, articles, they can all help to provide us with the information we need uh, to, to, to let people know about what life was like in the exhibits that they're working in so they can pass this information on to the visitors as they, as they come in. Um, it's really important to make use of as many different sort of types of source material as you can, from these photographs to original documents to, to perhaps sort of more popular history books as well. And what we do is we take that research and we condense that down into the sort of key facts about the exhibit or about the building, the structure that they're, they're going to be working in. And then on top of that, we can sort of embellish that with some more detail, perhaps some more personal stories, so that people can actually have a hook 
that they can use to really engage with different people as they come in. So it's about establishing a baseline of understanding, that level of knowledge that we really need to make sure everybody's got, so they've got the right dates and the right information. But then on top of that, building up these layers of information so we can, we can begin to, to bring people in with personal stories or stories that actually might sort of appeal to, to particular groups of people. What you find is that you develop, or, or that members of staff demonstrate, is that they'll develop over time a real sense of ownership about the exhibits that they're working in. And this can lead them to do sometimes an awful lot of very in-depth research. I mean, ultimately, one of the things that we talk about the most is social history. On Bliss Hill, it's about people. It's about this people's story and their experience of, of the sort of uh, the Industrial Revolution, this sort of late 19th century, uh, uh, late 19th century scene. And there's a lot of people very interested in family history. And family history is one of these uh, areas that has absolutely exploded and isn't necessarily bound by the kind of the very rigid academic rules that you might find in the sort of research that people would do in, in universities. But it allows people people to really go off and explore and find out all sorts of information. Now this is uh, a very good thing, very positive thing to have that level of ownership, but it does mean that you have to be aware of the work that they're carrying out. It's not about policing that work, but it's about understanding exactly which avenues it's taking those individuals down so that you can make sure that they're perhaps not uh, putting two and two together and making five, but that's got to be that's got to be handled quite delicately and quite gently to make sure that you don't end up putting people off carrying out this kind of research. But when it's done well, you get really enthusiastic people who can really communicate that enthusiasm to the visitors, and they have this whole whole range of different stories and a whole range of different sort of bits of information that they can give to the visitors when they come in. So when it works well, it's fantastic. Um, but it does require just that little uh, effort of, sort of monitoring and making sure that people don't necessarily disappear too far off down their own track because ultimately within the museum and the, the, the town itself of Bliss Hill, what we're trying to do is tell a coherent story. So underlying all of that, we've got these sort of key narratives that we want to get out there. So it's important that whilst these are fantastic embellishments and these wonderful sort of additional layers, it's all about the layers, um, it's really important that that doesn't detract from these key underlying narratives that come out uh, throughout, the, throughout the, the, the town itself. We do curate the interpretation that goes in there. We curate the message that comes out. And it's really important to, to make sure that we retain that level of, 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 of sort of integrity. If you see the, the newspaper headlines that we might have throughout the town, those are all headlines that are right for the period. You know, stories, local stories, national stories, international stories that come out there. It's a little thing. It goes there. We think about the typeface in which it's, it's printed, make sure that that's one that was around at the time. We make sure that the story is right. So people might just pass by it, or they might just see it as a piece of set dressing, perhaps. But it's been curated in that sense. It's been thought about from a historical perspective to make sure that it's right. I mean, of course, it is 2014. You can't stop 2014 from creeping in sometimes, be it aeroplanes overhead or whatever it might be. You know, to, to achieve 100% immersion in the past is going to be very difficult, nigh on impossible. But we try and make sure wherever possible that we, we curate the, all the information. We make sure that it's been checked and it's accurate and that the messages and the narratives that go out are all in keeping with the period that we're trying to recreate. So we're here in the Reserve Collection store at Ironbridge Gorge Museums and it might seem a slightly unusual um, way of starting a store but one of the reasons that we started having a reserve collection was so that we could actually use these objects at the museum, not just in, in display cases behind glass but actually using them on site. We understand that sometimes this makes objects more vulnerable and we, we bear that in mind when we're working with the objects and we don't choose the the very rare objects, obviously. Yeah. What we're using here are um, objects that really are representative of domestic and industrial life um, that would have been at um, a town like Bliss Hill. And these objects visitors can, can see, staff can pick them up, some of them visitors can pick up and, and look at more closely and really interact with the objects. And I think that's something that's so important about Bliss Hill um, as, a, as a museum is that it's really about the visitors engaging with um, and, and, and interacting with the site um, as it would have been really bringing the history to life. Obviously we can't, we don't have every object available um, for use um, and there 
there is a time and a place for really good replica objects. It's really important that we research these thoroughly so that we um, have the most accurate and authentic replicas that are available. When we take objects into the collection, we of course speak to the donors um, when, they're, when they're giving us the objects. And if it's something that we think would be useful at Bliss Hill, we would say to them um, and, and speak to them about the fact that these objects might actually be used and be touched and handled by the public or, or used um, in a shop or in a house at Bliss Hill. It's also a real advantage for the staff and demonstrators and volunteers. It gives them an opportunity to get to grips with the real objects that would have been used at the time and they're having to use them on a daily basis. Hello, my name is Jane Little. I'm the events officer at Bliss Hill Victorian Town and as you've heard, as well as our daily offer, we use a range of first and third person interpretation in our events to create the life of an everyday town in 1900. Um, obviously there are different categories of events and there are certain things that you have to do. Certain events are in the calendar and in fact you can maintain the tradition of them by, by doing them every year. These are things such as Pancake Day, May Day, you've got Easter, Christmas and uh, Bank Holidays. Other events would revolve around the uh, reality of life, that's birth, marriages and death. Now obviously birth is not one we can do easily. Uh, Death, not very popular, so we won't be doing that. But marriages are something that are quite easy to do and we, and we have done and we continue to do and change every year. Um, other events are things that would have happened in the time. We're set in 1900, so we celebrate Queen Victoria's birthday every year in May and we have celebrated her jubilee. Other events are ba based upon the life and culture of the time, so these can range from things like Morris dances to a town crier competition, military reenactment groups, and then literary based events which we develop with our actors here. These are based on sort of popular novels of the time and we've done Alice in Wonderland, Treasure Island and we're about to do Oliver Twist and they're really, really popular. As you can imagine, some events cost very little and some can be very expensive to do and often the reality is that an expensive event isn't actually the one that is noticed as much. The small scale events such as pancake flipping competition that we do every year is actually one of the most popular things we do and costs next to nothing to do. A few frying pans, a few pancakes, um, everybody's happy and this works well because it's not just the visitors involved, it involves the staff and wherever you can involve the staff you get a much greater reward. Weddings, which we talked about, were begun a few years ago and we tried um, several ways of doing these. The first was a reenactment of a wedding that was uh, depicted in a painting by Luke Files of the country wedding. This is of uh, 1883. And we did this really, really meticulously. We researched each character, everybody had a script. We could recreate that image that people knew so well. This works, okay, but we can't do this again. So we've had to change the weddings. You can't have the same person getting married all the time. And also you do have a problem with staff. You know, they don't like seeing their partner getting married to somebody else. Another of the problems of doing a wedding here is that when you do an event, you're doing it to involve the staff and the visitors, but it has to be seen to be done. What the visitors want is a photo opportunity. They like that feeling of involvement, but if they can't get a good photo, it doesn't really work for them. Now, our church is very small, so we can have a ceremony in there for 30 people, but only 30 people see it. So the challenge over the years has been to see how we can expand the weddings and make them more visible and get everybody more involved. So generally now, if we have a wedding, and it has to be somebody different every time, of course, because they notice, um, we follow this with a blessing in the pleasure gardens, and then that might be followed by a reception, either in the pub or the gardens, if the weather's good, and maybe some dancing, and that way you can and ring the changes and everybody's happy everybody gets a different photo opportunity and it works over the years you do different events and some have to stay some have to go and some you put on the shelf for the while and then bring them back and refresh them but inevitably if you're going to put on a big event you need people and you need involvement from people, whether it be staff or outside organisations. We have limited numbers of staff and in the summer, there are a lot of them on holiday, so we use a lot of reenactment groups to come in and help us. These can be fantastic, they're very committed, they love what they do, they love getting involved, but of course you need to work really closely with them to make sure that you're working to the same sort of you know page on the book and the, the finished product is what you're both working towards. 
they do provide that great photo opportunity for the visitor um, because staff are often in an exhibit and busy doing things so that that can work very well an example of um, a big event that we do here every year is Queen Victoria's birthday I mean this would not work without the the input of outside organizations I can book people to come in such as the Punch and Judy show but you do have to know who you're booking you have to trust that they're going to give you exactly what you're looking for and be that right person but the reenactment groups really really add to this the visitors love nothing better than to be in an event and be sitting next to someone in costume who will actually talk to them as well and that interaction is worth so much Essentially, when you're using reenactors or outside people, it's the confidence you have in them that matters. They need to like you, you need to like them, and we all need to know that we're going to get on together. And often the best way of achieving this is with tea, coffee, and a lot of cheese rolls. In conclusion, I would say that first person works really well when you reenact events. It's what the visitors expect, and it's what works well with us. So as I said at the outset, it's not possible to go into all the interpretation we do at Bliss Hill, especially its first and third person interpretation. But I hope we've given you some practical food for thought, especially if you're thinking of bringing in first and third person or developing living history at your own sites. This is not something you should do lightly, nor should it be something which seems too onerous or contentious to explore. It does require investment financially and in terms of time for research and training. You need to be clear of where it sits in your current learning and interpretation strategy and you need to be able to keep a focus on it. It is very easy to drop into play acting and entertainment over education. So have systems in place which allows you to monitor what you are adding and for reviewing and evaluating it. As Tony Jackson from PLH states, a well-designed and executed performance is amongst the most powerful of interpretive techniques and can embrace the visitor's appreciation and critical understanding of the subject matter. When performance is offered as part of a museum experience, it is more frequently mentioned in the narratives of the visitors than in any other aspects of their visit, especially over the longer term. Memory is often aided by recall of the performance's immediate surroundings and the artefacts which were used to support this. Performance can be used to sensitively offer insight and understanding into what can be a challenging and a difficult historic theme, and it can help raise a deeper awareness and understanding of the subject matter, especially as PLH found when evaluating this accursed thing at Manchester Museum. Visitors had the opportunity to interact with the slave master and to question his motives and reasoning, and though their feelings remained that it was wrong, the motives were far better understood and there was a more rounded awareness of the whole story. Don't think you have to do it all yourself or that it is too complicated and involved. As we have heard, there are some excellent organisations, both professionally and amateur, who would love the opportunity to work with you and to explore your sites and their collections. If you would like further information, please do not hesitate to contact us, details of which will be at the end of this presentation. And so, in the final tradition of Bliss Hill and its musical, I will leave you with this final message. Now you may think that this is the end. Well, it is.